We cannot simply say, I'm going to follow whatever my parents did. That this is my source of gaining knowledge of Islam. Because if my parents didn't get their knowledge from Rasulullah then there is a possibility that their knowledge is incorrect. This is something we have to realistically look at. Where is the pure source? The spring of life, where is it? It is in the Quran and in the Sunnah. This is where it is. It is in the Quran and in the Sunnah. This is revelation from Allah. This is where salvation, where life lies. And we have to be very careful that we don't fall into the same situation which the pagans exhibited in the time of Prophet Muhammad as referred to uh, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 104, wherein Allah describes the response of the pagans to the call to the Quran and the Sunnah. If we said this is the source of life, and the pagans who went astray, who died in a state of disbelief and went to hell, their response we should be well aware of. What was their response? Allah says in Surah Al Maidah. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ وَلَا الرَّسُولُ And if you say to them, Muhammad وسلم, come to what Allah has revealed and to his messenger, to the Quran and to the Sunnah. قَالُوا Their response, حَسْبُنَا مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا It is enough for us what we found our four parents doing. It is enough for us what we found our four parents doing. This was the response of the pagans. This was the response of disbelief. This was the response which caused Abu Talib to go to hell. Abu Talib who raised Prophet Muhammad وسلم, who knew who he was, who knew he was a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But on his deathbed, when Prophet Muhammad وسلم, invited him and said, say la ilaha illallah, uncle, say la ilaha illallah, and I will be a witness with you before Allah on the day of judgment. And Abu Talib's brothers were there saying to him, are you going to embarrass our family? Are you going to degrade our family? Are you going to reject the ways of our foreparents? Were our foreparents all wrong? Was Abdul Muttalib wrong? Was Abdul Manaf wrong? Were they all wrong? Are you going to reject that? And Abu Talib chose to go with the way of his foreparents. And what was the result? Prophet Muhammad said that he receives the least punishment on the day of judgment. The least. For the good that he did in terms of raising the Prophet Muhammad protecting him, etc., etc. He received the least. But what is the least described in Sahih Muslim? That the hellfire will reach up to his ankles. Only his ankles will be in the hellfire. But it will be enough for his brains to boil. And he will think that he is receiving the worst punishment of anybody in hell. 
That is the re result. That is the consequence of that response. Hasbuna ma wajadna alayhi abaana. It is enough for us what our foreparents did, what they're doing. That's enough. This is the response of misguidance. The response of the pagans. So we have to be very careful about this. When we are invited, when somebody invites us to what Allah and His Messenger said, that we do not respond to them by saying what? Well, this is not what my parents did. My parents were doing something else and I'm going to do what they did. I am from this community or that community. Our community does this and that and the other. The explanation is not, well, Allah also said that, or Prophet Muhammad also said that. So we can properly choose, because of course, not everybody who comes to you and says, Allah said this, and the Prophet said that, is necessarily having the right understanding, and so you just automatically should stop whatever you're doing and follow it. Because the knowledge of the Quran is vast, and the Sunnah is also vast. Therefore, we also have to have a knowledge and a comparative knowledge of, of the Sunnah as well as the Quran. So that response, which is based on comparative knowledge, this is an acceptable response. This is, we're trying to judge what is right according to knowledge. We're not doing it according to emotion because this is what was the response of the pagans. That is based on emotion. My parents did it. My grandparents did it. My great-grandparents were doing it. So were they all wrong? Am I going to say they were all wrong? See, this is emotion. This is not looking at the thing, is it right or is it wrong, really? Factually speaking, you know, we have, what is our criterion for determining right and wrong? Emotion blinds. We have to do it on the basis of knowledge, correct knowledge. So we have to develop the correct knowledge of Allah, the correct knowledge of the Sunnah, and in the process, we have to eliminate from ourselves the vestiges of that to unwat. Meaning, we have to look into ourselves and into our practices and remove those practices which are from pre-Islamic times, which we have inherited, which we have adopted from the cultures around us, etc. Some of these practices may seem very simple. Some of them may seem very big. But we have to know that no matter how small things are, for us to make a big change, we have to be able to make small changes. Because if we find difficulty in making small changes, you can be sure we're not going to be able to make the big change. So when knowledge comes to us on a personal level, that knowledge may be about simple, small things in terms of men. That knowledge may be, brother, grow your beard. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he said in Sahih Bukhari, grow your beards and trim your mustaches. So some brothers say, this is not important. It's not an important part of the religion. Islam is in the heart. You must be sincere, everything else. This is what needs to be. You know, these outward things are not important. But one has to question oneself. Is Islam only inward? Or is it both inward and outward? Why are we so reluctant? Why are we so unwilling to do something so basic when there's clear instruction for us? Or another person may say, brother, your pants are below your ankles. Raise your pants above your ankle. Brother, what is this? Is this all the religion is? It's just about your short pants or long pants? Come on, man. This is more important things. You know? 
There's an atomic bomb being developed here in India and one in, in Pakistan and what's going to happen? And you're going to tell me about shortening my pants? We have to question here. You see, this is a small thing. It may seem to be insignificant. But Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he said in authentic hadith, that what is below the ankle is in the hellfire. He said that. You can be a good Muslim by performing your rituals, by behaving yourself in a good manner that represents Quran and Sunnah. Prophet peace be upon him prohibited all forms of alcohol and narcotic. It is haram. It is prohibited. Whatever good you do is going to transform into blessing from Allah Azza wa So you have to know what Allah wants from you. Um, so we should try to, you know, to be the best Muslim that we possibly can be. Heart to Heart Counseling in Youth Talk tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 6.30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Sundays provide. In Britain, we are facing one big problem that are you Muslim or British? The space to talk. In India, back home, they ask, are you a Muslim first or Indian first? And we Muslims should know how to reply, how to turn the tables over. The place to knock. Why Trinity cannot be regarded in that sense? Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The opportunity to ask. But even if we agree that what the Christians say, that he was crucified, so if Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died for three days, who controlled the world? That means even God died? The freedom to unmask. So there are various ways which we can prove the argument to be wrong. Let's meet Dr. Zakir every Sunday at 7 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 8 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين ترافي Next on Peace TV. He made a big thing of it. So it is not the person who comes and passes this information to us. We should not respond to, oh, why are you making such a big thing about such a small thing? No. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu made a big thing about it. And we have to question ourselves. Why? Is it such a problem for us to shorten our pants? Brother says, well, you know, the hadith, when it spoke about Abu Bakr, it said, uh, the one who drags his garment or lets it below the ankle out of pride. So I, I'm not doing it out of pride. It's not pride. We say, brother, why don't you shorten the pants? Look into yourself. Is it because you feel that in doing that, you will be out of style? You're not in fashion? Hmm? This out of fashion fashion is the fashion of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu And he said, فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي Whoever loves a way, a fashion, other than mine, is not a true follower of mine. Aren't we here loving the ways of the disbelievers? Isn't it their fashion? Isn't it they who put their pants below their ankles? And they did it at a particular period of time, which has to do with historical developments in America when the hippies came out and the hippies were about letting all hang out their hair long everything long dragging on the ground everything and then in the west you see the west has a way of turning every trend into profitable business so long hair became a fashion long pants dragging below the ankles became a fashion so it was 
just integrate it into the economics of the system. That's the reason. So we have to look at the situation today. These are small things, as I said. They're small things. But if we have difficulty dealing with such small things as this, growing your beard is to stop shaving. It's not doing something you weren't doing, but it's not doing something you were doing. It's always easier to stop doing than to do. And you, have, you can't do that. Shortening your, you know, the variety of other things. Similarly, in the case of women, you know, with the hijab, we know what Prophet Muhammad said about what is hijab. We know what Allah said about hijab. We all know it is not something new, but yet our women insist on going around wearing hijab, which is so thin you can see what is underneath. So what hijab is this? Prophet Muhammad said one of the signs of the last day is that the women will be dressed but undressed. They're wearing clothing, but they may as well not be wearing clothing because you can see what is underneath. Or they're wearing garments. You know, the, instead of wearing the outer garments which should cover them in loose fashion, etc., they're wearing styles which are tight-fitting. You can see the shapes of their bodies and all this kind of thing. And if they are questioned, they say, this is our culture. You know, we are, this is Indian style, you know. We're not uh, Egyptians, we're not Saudis, we're not, you know. That's their cultural thing. Of course, imitating their fashion or their way is not required in Islam. What we are required to imitate is the way prescribed by Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, it is essential for us to look back into ourselves and to make these kind of corrections. It's essential for us to look into our families and the role of the families with regards to education, the responsibilities. We have a responsibility to teach our children, to create an environment in the home which is an Islamic environment, which will encourage them to remember Allah. If our environment in the home is television, watching Hindi movies and, you know, singing, dancing, all this wild stuff, and then we wonder when our children want to get out and do these same things, we say, why, why? You know, this is not Muslim. But this is what we have raised them on. We have a responsibility in the home, that area that we control, to establish an Islamic environment. An environment wherein the remembrance of Allah is there. Not to say that it is without fun, without laughter, without, you know, the enjoyment of life, yes. But it should be in accordance with the way and the guidance that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi gave us. Similarly, in the community, there is a responsibility for education. And when we look at the family and the community, we have to look at issues, there are certain pressing issues in the society today which have to do with the practices of the people of the past. And I just mention them because I know it is a disease here. The disease regarding dowry, for example. These are family problems now, community problems. The dowry issue. That when a man wants to marry his daughter he has to give money, wealth, to the bride, groom, bridegroom, the male. Islam has mahar. The mahar is given by the male to the female to indicate a symbolic of his preparedness to look after that young lady, that lady woman. This is mahar. That's what we have in Islam. But in Hindu culture and in Christian culture, the practice is the opposite. They paid the men to marry their daughters. This is their practice. As a result, you have the phenomenon in India of bride burnings. 
I'm not telling you something that you're not well aware of. How many hundreds of women are burnt to death every year by their husbands and their mothers-in-laws and others because they didn't bring the dowries that were promised or the family wants more. Now, one may say, oh, that's their problem. But guess what? I read in the newspaper uh, not too long ago that in Dhaka, well, you might say it's not India, but it's India. I mean, people draw the lines and say, this is Bangladesh and this is India. But reality, it is all one. In Dhaka, it said, a greedy husband burned to death his young wife at Sikpara in the city following a feud over dowry, police said. They said Zahir Mia poured gasoline over the body of his wife, Shahnaz, and set her on fire on Sunday. She died at Dhaka Medical College Hospital yesterday. This is Muslims. This is a sickness. It is something which the Muslim community must eradicate. It is something which is harmful to the community. This is why you will find that men, when their wives give birth to daughters, their face is, oh, another girl, a girl. If their wife can't give birth to boys, they want to divorce them. This happens amongst Muslims. A boy, they're happy. But girls are not happy. Why? Because girls are problems. You have to think about how much money you have to know. You know, you have five, six daughters. You're, your life is now hell. You have to be raised and getting money from here, there, everything, trying to get them married. So much so that this belief has led to a distortions of basic Islamic practices. So you will find it common amongst Muslims who have this belief of this dowry, etc. They will say, it is not compulsory for a man to make hajj if he has a daughter of marriageable age. Priority is getting his daughter married. So it is not required of him to make hajj until he gets his daughter married. This is falsehood. This is a lie. This is against Islam. Prophet Muhammad said, whoever has the means to make hajj and doesn't make hajj, it makes no difference to Allah whether he died a Christian or a Zoroastrian or whatever. Hajj is compulsory once one has the means. This new idea has only come up because Muslims have started the practice of paying dowries for their daughters. That's where it came from. So you can see how false ideas like this can actually go back and hurt the very pillars of Islam, damage them, distort them. So people will, will not fulfill a pillar of Islam because of this innovation. I just would like to, in the few remaining minutes, touch on some other aspects related to the establishment of Islam in a non-Muslim society. And that is the setting up of institutions. So it is essential for Muslims to establish academic institutions which have the proper ethos, the proper concept, the proper goals, the prof proper uh, methodologies. If we put our children in non-Muslim schools taught by non-Muslims, can we expect them to grow up with an Islamic understanding? No. And they spend more time in the schools than they spend at home. What is going to be the end result? The end result is what we are seeing around us today where the masjids are filled with the old and the dying. The youths are elsewhere 
in the cinema, in the discos, etc. This is the realities of a lack of an educational system by which to convey Islam in an academic environment so that the graduates of such schools would be able to take their place in society with the correct perspective. It means that we need institutions. We need schools, primary, secondary schools, which are teaching in English medium. In English medium because the future, the present, is in English medium and knowledge. Teaching academics, your sciences, all the subjects, but by Muslim teachers and from an Islamic perspective. The Islamization of knowledge. We cannot simply say, I'm going to follow whatever my parents did. That this is my source of gaining knowledge of Islam. Because if my parents didn't get their knowledge from Rasulullah then there is a possibility that their knowledge is incorrect. This is something we have to realistically look at. Allah.